On today's episode, I talked to Brian Passon. Brian is a wellness enigma, meaning he's involved in many different areas of wellness, including a company called Quantified Habits, Arch Health, and he also co-created Wellness Underground. So Brian and I talked the whole gamut of worksite wellness. He tells us how he ended up in the space, and we also weigh in on best practices, premium contributions, and return on investment. So we ended up talking an entire hour, so I decided to split this one into two episodes. And so I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Today we have Brian Passon, and Brian has been around the field long enough to have done some crappy wellness programs and some great ones too. Those are his words, not mine. With a graduate degree in sports psychology, Brian wants people and organizations to achieve optimal work and life performance. He's worked within the insurance environment, formed a consulting company, co-created the Wellness Underground, and now also is working at Quantified Habits. Brian aims to develop habit-forming technologies and solutions for individuals, organizations, and health coaches. Brian has a desire to be constructively disruptive in order to maximize success. Welcome, Brian. Good morning. Thank you. How are you today? So far, so good. All right. Another day Another day alive, blue skies, warm weather, what's not to like? <laughs> and you're in your Victorian, what is it, a turret? Turret? Yeah. I'm in the turret, yep, turret. the third floor in my home office, enjoying an iced coffee and, uh, you know, looking forward to settling down to this podcast. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. And, I, of course, I have to start with this constructively disruptive descriptor. Tell me what that's all about. Yeah, so, you know, we, a group of friends and I, you know, we would always meet up at these various conferences and uh, inside the wellness industry, and we would be speaking at different things or just hanging out, and we would be the ones in the back of the room being very cynical and snickering, um, going, gosh, what is up with this whole industry, and where is it headed? And then there was a lot of people, you know, that we were reading, saying some good stuff, but always having a real negative tone, it seemed like. So we just thought, gosh, we want to be disruptive, but we don't want to be just disruptive for the sake of being, you know, a nuisance. We want to be constructively disruptive. So we sort of uh, teamed up and said, hey, what can we do to help be, you know, make fun of ourselves a little bit, be a little self-deprecating, uh, be, you know, ask some questions that are hard. Um, and just get people thinking on their own rather than taking everybody else's word for it. So be a little, be disruptive to our industry and get people, you know, asking questions. And, and if they answer back with, hey, this is the way we do it and it works for us, great. Um, but yeah, we didn't want to be all negative all the time. We wanted to be able to say what's working, what's not working. If it's not working, how can we do it better? And let's, let's build on that. So. Yeah, well, we won't mention any names there. I'll just, I'll just leave that to everyone's uh, imagination. So when yeah, you're saying... Well, and I, think, I think it's good in any industry to have that. And I think the negative people are good to have because they're bringing up points and things. But I, I don't think it's a sustainable model. I think it's something that people, people want to see what's wrong. But then they also want to be given, hey, how can we make it better? And what are some of the options and opportunities out there? Right. And I think it has caused everyone to kind of sit up and listen and actually question things. I know I heard that a little bit before I left my last job, but I don't think it's, I think it's getting to the wellness profession, like we're talking about it, but I don't know if as many people who are actually implementing the wellness programs, like the HR person, if they're really in tune to that conversation, I think there's a little bit of a, a gap between what's happening mm -hmm. at our, you know, kind of wellness expertise angle and then what's kind of the brass tacks, people actually implementing it. So what do you think about, you said what's working and what's not working with the wellness industry or in worksite wellness in general. So what do you think is, is working? Let's start on the positive. What's working today with worksite wellness? I think there's a lot that is working. Um, and, uh, you know, I get the question asked a lot, who's doing it well and, and who's, who's doing wellness well. And, and I always, my wife has a, 
as a marketer and a photographer, she has a phrase on her computer and it says, you know, comparison is a thief of joy. Um, and so when people are asking me, you know, who, who's doing it really well, I always wonder, like, are they looking for ideas or are they really to, looking to compare themselves to one up or, you know, trying to be like keeping up with the Joneses with their who has the best vendor or best product or, or utilizing solutions that are supposed to answer all the ills of the health of their program. Um, so what's working to me is organizations that are just sort of owning it and taking it on and doing what they can for themselves, who aren't vendoring everything out, who are saying, gosh, this is what we believe in and what we want to accomplish rather than, you know, going out and try trying to buy something or just listening to the vendors and what the vendors are telling them they should want or their broker or whoever, whoever's out there. Um, yeah, I used to get that so, question all the time. Who's doing what? And they always want to know what others in their industry are doing. But as we know, the cultures and, and different organizations are completely different. So yep. I, I've always hated that question. I know it's irrelevant because you need that social proof that it's working somewhere else. But it's mm -hmm. also... Uh, it's hard to give them that answer because what's working in one place may not work for them. Yeah, you just, I always come back with, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Good question. Um, and more often than not, I get a blank stare. Uh, <laughs> right. So it's like, well, you know, why do you want to know what others are doing? Because their goals are probably different than yours. So if you want to tell me what you're trying to accomplish, then I can share with you what some other like minded companies are doing that might be fitting for you. Um, so I think that's where I. Probably in the next few years, I see more companies turning to internal um, with their wellness efforts and what they're doing and being more worried about them and, and hey, we have to own this and, and what, what are we trying to accomplish? I think that's where we're finally getting at it. Um, you know, I had a phrase in a, that, that I've said a few times, but, you know, rather than worrying about best practices or next practices, you know, we should be worrying about what you practice is. Um, what's working for you and your organization and what's going to give you the best outcome over time. Um, so start, start thinking about you and your company rather than, you know, everybody else. And I think that's, that's where the future will be. And that's where it'll be fun and unique because everybody's going to be different then. Yeah. And I have to say that I'm not a huge fan of the word best practices. I actually read a whole blog post about it because I feel like people want to know best practices. It's the same type of things that you hear and it's always in how you implement them, right? So you can say, mm -hmm. have a wellness committee, have senior leadership support, all that's really good, all well and good. But when you implement a wellness committee, how effective is it? it, it it's, there's still just the implementation is typically off with best practices. And I don't know, it's, it's one of my pet peeve terms. So I like, I like you practices. And that's a good way to go. And then initially it is much more it's much more work because you have to then now understand your people, your culture, your organization. You have to start asking questions about what you want. You can't just get this list and check the box. And so, you know, I also have people say, well, who's, who's winning awards for, you know, the best places to work or the healthiest employers? And I said, you know, I, you can look at the lists, whether it's in various states or cities. And I said, but really the ones who have the best workplaces aren't applying for these awards and you'll never know about them or hear about them because they don't care. They're just being them and they're, they're worried about their business and who they are not trying to apply for these awards. Um, a lot of the companies I see on these sort of healthiest places to work, I've, I've been inside of them. I know them and I'm like, wow, that's, they must have looked real good on paper because I've been there, and they are not a healthy business. Well, I so. think, yeah, I've been to one uh, about, about a year ago, and honestly, everything starts blending together because they introduce the the speakers, and now it gets to I'm mean, not the speakers, the you know the employers, and everyone's got a gym, everyone's got you know, fresh fruit on site, so everything starts blending together. And I almost wish that these uh, these award systems would actually go in and survey the employees unannounced, and then really go see yeah. how much the employees really like how much the, you know, the wellness program is doing for them or their employer is doing for them. And I don't well, think they're I ever actually, asking, they're never asking the employees if they, if they think the wellness program is great. Yeah. Well, I actually was talking to a, a business journal in a city not to be mentioned. And I said, Hey, you know, so how are you determining, you know, what is a healthiest business in your area? And she's like, well, we took this other form from this other organization 
And we send it out to companies and they check the boxes and send them back. And then we have a review committee that looks at them and determines. And I was like, she literally just said they checked the boxes. Like, nice. Yep. All right. Yes. I will say, though, let me give my little caveat that I have worked with some companies that that helps with a little bit of buy-in. I know, oh, sure. I know everyone wants the senior leaders to be bought in and, and, and fully engaged in the wellness program. I get it. But sometimes if you're going, hey, and this is, there's this cool award that we can win in, you know, if we go down this path. So sometimes it just hits them going, oh, yeah, I'd love an award. Although I fully yep. agree that the people who are really focused on their culture and work state wellness don't care as much about the awards. But I think the awards can be nice for some, some organizations. Yeah, I actually had an organization I was working with and, um, and working with their wellness person. And she actually looked at me and said, I have to apply for this award because it helps me secure funds. And I said, then let's do it. Let's not apply for this award so that we can, you know, tell everybody we're the healthiest business. You know, she was doing it because if they get on the list, then it looks good for her and her executive committee. And she gets funds then that she can do some amazing things. And I said, all right, I like your perspective there. She's like, it doesn't mean we're a healthy business. It means I get my budget. I was like, <laughs> hey, that, that's realistic. I like, that's authentic. Good. Yes, but I do wish that these uh, journal awards would maybe listen up and, and go a different way because pretty soon I think everyone's going to be doing the same thing and everyone's going to get these awards. And it really, I mean, I don't know how much it means now, but if they could really flip it and say, instead of someone applying for an award, we're going to go in and independently assess the organization, which is really, you know, kind of a pipe dream because they're not going to take that much energy and effort for it. Because, no. you know, it's really around business and kind of not around health and wellness. It's just, uh, yeah. you know, whatever it is. All right. So yes. we definitely went on a tangent, which was a good one because I've been, I've been wanting to talk about those awards for a while. But what about what is where do we need improvement in, in the worksite wellness world? Uh, I think continue, I think it sort of continues on what's working and whatever I see a shift. But that is uh, getting organizations to own it for themselves. Um, I was on a panel recently at, uh, at an event and someone was asking me some questions um, about where I see sort of things going. And I said, you know, I could almost see in the next five to ten years um, in our industry, not just our industry of wellness, but in employer organizations as a whole, that they're going to be spending a lot more effort and monies on having an internal person for not just wellness, but overall productivity, which will incorporate wellness, um, you know, productivity, maybe even great place to work, those types of things, um, and shifting to being more people focused. So, you know, why would I spend fifty thousand dollars on a vendor to do some of these things for us, where we're getting you know twenty percent participation, or you know, eight percent looking at a web portal, or all, you know, they're spending vast amounts of money on that. I'd rather have, if I was a small business, a part-time person who either worked for me or worked within my company that could be there to experience my business, to really know my people, and to work on creating a better place to work and a healthier place um, that actually sits in my office, you know, 20 or 30 hours a week, or for larger companies, and I, what, I, by what I mean by larger is maybe even like a company of two or 300 employees having a full-time person that is there focused on making it a, a healthy, productive culture and atmosphere. So. That's, absolutely. And that's actually one of the biggest gaps I saw in my previous job is employers, even to the level of having 3,000 employees, didn't have anyone on, on the team, on the HR staff that really had any wellness expertise. Yep. It, it was an HR person that's typically, you know, hey, go do this wellness program, and they're doing the best that they can. And it, the staffing is such a gap, and we do need more wellness experts on site to, to really look at the, the bigger picture of the organization and the culture. And even if they're launching a portal, you can't launch a wellness portal without some kind of communication and buy-in. Mm -hmm. So uh, staffing is such a big need, and I'm not so sure. So I see, I see a bright future for wellness professionals um, and maybe a less bright future for the thousands and the plethora of vendors that are out there. I think a lot of them will get weeded out. And it's not to say we don't need them, 
because it would be a shame to have you know great people on site looking to implement some programs and things, and then not have great vendors to be able to offer some outside programs and and fun initiatives and things. Um, so I think we we need both, but I think we need more great professionals and less vendors. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't help. I don't know if you saw. I think it was the February edition of Inc. Magazine that rated uh, corporate wellness as the, the top growing industry in the next five years. Um, I did not see that. Like, yeah, I was like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if that's good or bad because that's great that now, hey, that we're going to be growing, but that's bad because now every everybody out there is going to be trying to create some crappy corporate wellness system that's you know going to try and be packaged and sold and to everybody. So we'll see. But it is exciting that it's, it seems to be a, definitely a growing field, but that comes back to how many great wellness professionals are really out there. Well, um, well even when you think about it, and I want to get... I want you to take us through like kind of the history of your career. I mean, I'm a dietitian by training. I got into worksite wellness because I had a dietetics background and could start into the worksite wellness field, but I wasn't educated in general health education. I learned it by, you know, 12 years of doing it. So how did you get your start in the, in the worksite wellness field? Uh, dumb luck, <laughs> right place, right time. That's how it happens, right? Uh, pretty much. So, you know, my undergrad was spent out on the West Coast and uh, was double majoring in human health and performance and psychology. And then when I decided I want to go to grad school, I was like, hey, let's sports psychology sounds fun. That's kind of a, a nice blending. Um, so I did my graduate work in sports psychology and then did some work, uh, my research on look, uh, physical self perceptions of children through after doing uh, weight training. So kids like 8 to 12 years old using small downsized weight training equipment and their physical self-perceptions after like a 12-week program and finding that, you know, as we know, kids who exercised compared to kids who didn't felt better about their bodies. Even if they didn't make any, you know, massive muscle gains or strength gains or anything, they just felt better. Um, so I finished up my graduate work and was like... You know, I'm not ready. To, did my graduate work on the East Coast and thought I'm not ready to move back to Oregon yet. My wife and I, we weren't ready, so we're like, well, let's just I'll find a job. So got hired inside this uh, tiny little insurance TPA in Connecticut that had had a uh, wellness program since 1985, uh, believe it or not. So, was, so it, was, it a, was it a wellness program, like quote air quote wellness program, or was it like a real? It was program? a. It was a, a program, they had sort of their own internal company that was developed first for their internal employees. Um, at the time, the company was owned by a, a former uh, pro football player um, who was not the exact epitome of health, but he, he um, always said, I always performed my best when I was in my best physical condition, so why not help my employees do that? So he started it internally, and then um, a lot of the organizations he was working with started saying, hey, we want that for our employees. So it sort of branched out. So I got hired there and just sort of got into the field. And within too long, we were doing some great things and growing and working with a lot of employers, small and medium size in the state of Connecticut, and just really got into the field and going, gosh, you know, it really is all about optimal performance. Whether I'm working with elite athletes, and I had done some work with some college athletes in the sports psychology arena, or it's working with, um, you know, your corporate athletes, sort of your your gym lores and and people who are talking about you know being a corporate athlete. I think that was when it hit me. Like, what I really enjoy doing is seeing uh, you know people and businesses experience optimal functioning. And that has translated to so what started out as health, and now it's, it's transitioning into not just uh, you know, the health of your employees, but uh, the overall you know, optimal functioning of your business and taking a look at you know, patterns and, and what's going on inside the organization and how people move through the office and what they do. So, so that's you know, how I stumbled into the industry. I had no idea that it was an industry, and I just sort of got in and was like, I'll just do this job for a little bit while we you know, explore New England a little more. And then it was like, oh, I actually kind of like this. Right. Yeah, like I did when I was in college, and I'm not that old, but I, you know, I 
there was no health education. There was no, um, you know, anything around worksite wellness. But now they have, you know, I had people on my team previously that had a worksite wellness degree or some kind of specialization in it coming out of school. But when I was getting my nutrition degree, I tried to get a psychology minor and I couldn't even do that. It wasn't an option at my university. And I feel Mm -hmm. like a lot of the stuff that we're doing with worksite wellness is so, uh, psychological, right? It's, it's about behavior change and getting people to want to change, not always giving them information on what they should be eating or exercising, those type things. And I don't think we get enough yeah. of the background in psychology um, necessarily with the curriculum that I've had with nutrition. And that was the what I really loved about the sports psychology arena was it was about, you know, looking at op- not just optimal performance, but motivators and understanding theories of performance and and how can you relate that down to the common person and and getting people fully engaged and and going gosh i you know i can get i can get compliance but how do i get somebody who's really excited and engaged and motivated Uh, that's a perfect segue into the compliance versus engagement right or participation versus versus engagement i feel like I guess in the past few years, we're starting to talk about that more when I'd say maybe five years ago, it was all about participation and getting as much participation as possible in your wellness programs. And I think now people are starting to kind of step back and question, well, is it just compliance? Are they just doing it to check a box? Which, yes, I would say most of them are. So tell me a little bit about how you encourage work sites to gain engagement instead of compliance or just participation. Well, I think that's part of the evolution of our industry, which isn't that old, really, if you think back to how long, you know, corporate wellness has been around. Um, And part of it is is going through those bumps in the road where you're like, hey, we want everybody involved and then going, oh, I guess everybody involved is great. But what we really want is (laughs) not everybody who shows up to be not only there, but to be engaged and and wanting to be there and and taking an active role in, in participating. Um, for me, it really comes back down to, you know, what we sort of started with is asking the organizations, what, do, what are your outcomes? What are you trying to accomplish here? Um, if their goal literally is, you know, push information on people, then, you know, compliance might be it. But that's not really where I think most companies want to go. They, they're not saying we need to put as many people in a, ro- as a, in a room as we can because we're trying to brainwash them. That's not, what, <laughs> that's not usually what they're wanting, but that's usually how they're acting. Like, hey, we're going to pay them $100 each to show up for this event. And you're like, well, oh, great, they showed up. And maybe, maybe they got a piece of information they can walk out the door with. But um, for me, it's much more about asking the company, you know, what are their goals and objectives and what are they trying to accomplish? And then working with them diligently to make sure that the program they're developing or the initiatives match their, their objectives. I think a lot of times they get off track. They're like, Hey, we expect this massive outcome, but we're not going to, we're only going to give you X amount of dollars. And, And it's important for us as the professionals to look at them and go, well, you want that great outcome. We can probably get there. Um, in a few years, but not with the budget you have. So you either have to increase budget or reduce expectations um, or increase timeline or reduce expectation. So I think, I think that comes along with it. It's just an, a general understanding. And, and if, if they have an understanding of, I want more than participation, um, then it comes down to, okay, now we need to design for your people. We're not going to bring in all these vendors and offer all these programs before we start looking at Let's design for the actual individuals in your workplace. What do they want? What do they need? What are they interested in? Um, how can we build off of you know, social contagions and all of these different theories, but really designing for the individual, not looking to what can we buy and throw at people because that's the quick and easy answer. So I guess that would be the answer to the, you know, whenever we're talking about worksite wellness ROI and, you know, I think there's been enough shifting that people are talking about value on investment, but I think the question still comes up. So when I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer this question for you from what you just said is, I guess you're saying, what budget are you giving? What expectations do you have? And maybe we can get there if uh, the appropriate, I guess, expectations are set. But I'll, of course, let you answer it, too. What do you tell an employer who's coming in questioning the ROI of wellness? 
Well, again, it comes back to, you said it, it comes down to value. And again, asking them, you know, what are your expectations? What do you value? What are you looking to get out of this? And if their answer is, I expect medical dollars to be reduced, I kind of come back at them and, and, and say, well, how, how many different touch points are involved in, let's say, one health claim? You know, how many, t- how many different points are involved in determining what that actual bill is in the end? And then you start walking them through, you know, all the different scenarios of what could happen or how it could be priced and what they could be paying. And you're like, look, wellness is probably less than 1% opportunity to impact the actual dollar value of any health claim. Um, what you're trying to do is probably get people healthier, more engaged, more productive, um, if their ultimate goal is really lower health care costs, that is a long-term goal. And sure, it's good, but I'm not sure that that's where the value is. And to use a phrase that I've heard many times, is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Most of these companies that want, are demanding that ROI are going, I need that next year. And you're going, man, it's not going to happen next year. So for me, it comes down to, again, asking them. And as a professional who's on my own and I can do these types of things, if I go into a company and we're having a conversation and they're making these demands on ROI, I can walk out the door and be like, you are not a company that I want to work with because your, your demands and your expectations and your budget and all these other things you're telling me don't line up. So that's not the type of organization that I can help if they're not willing to make a change or do something different. Yeah, give it time, give it focus, change the culture. There's a lot of steps you got to get to before you get to the ROI. And if it's your number one goal, then may not be the right company to work with. But it is crazy. I, it's crazy to me, like how many employers, what they expect out of work site wellness. And there's, yep. t- there's tons of, I've worked in a company for what, eight and a half years. And before that, you know, other companies, and there's so much, money being spent, there's training, there's a lot of things that, a lot of money and investment that they're putting into employees that do not expect a return on investment. But for some reason, worksite wellness is, you know, given no budget, given no time, given no strategic direction, but yet it's supposed to give this giant ROI. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I was meeting, gosh, this was probably eight years ago or so, meeting with a company down in the South and and they had a couple of different vendors in, and I was sitting there, and they looked at me, and they, they, they said, you know, what's your, what's your guaranteed ROI? So I'm not going to give that to you. I can't <laughs> guarantee you anything. And, they, you know, and they were like, oh, you know, what do you mean? And I said, well, yeah, I said, you know, anybody that can guarantee you an ROI, you should walk them out the door right now. And they were like, wow, thank you for being so honest. You're the first person that's come in here, you know, not guaranteeing some type of return. I said, there are so many hands in this pot. And there's so much that we could be doing to help, but you know, a lot of it comes back to the organization and how much you guys embrace it and support it and do some of these things. And I said, but let me ask you a question. And I was looking at their CFO who was in the room. I said, what's your ROI on your 401k match? And he's like, well, nothing. It, you know, we lose money on that. I said, but you do it, right? He's like, yeah. I said, well, why? He's like, because... We want to take care of our people. I said, exactly. Said. I said, so, you know, we're looking at something that for many businesses is just a drop in the bucket of total costs and expenditures. Like you said, trainings or whether it's healthcare dollars, you want to put everything lumped into what you do for your employees. Wellness is a tiny little drop in the bucket. And yet it has these giant expectations put on it that, no, no other employee wellness initiative has. Oh, wait, what, uh, what gets me is that when you see healthcare claims and you get a self-funded account around the thousand, two thousand mark employees, you're spending fourteen million dollars, sixteen million dollars on healthcare costs, but yet yep. getting, you know, a staff person is nearly impossible. Even when you think about the percentage of costs that is compared to your healthcare claims, it's insane. Yep. And then when you really take a look at it, you're going, "Gosh, if we're improving health, we're." not only improving, you know, hopefully improving the chances of reducing maybe some of these medical expenditures, but what other employee thing that you do has the opportunity to impact every employee metric at your organization, from absenteeism to increasing productivity to just, you know, having a generally nicer bunch of people working there that can support one another. I mean, you know, your 401k match isn't doing that either. So... I think it's just one of those where I, I want to know who 20, 30, 40 years ago set us up for this 
uh, awful ROI thing um, in the first place. And, and I think it comes back to they were working too hard to sell wellness rather than really explaining it and helping groups understand it. And that's one of my pet peeves is we've worked way too hard at selling. And if you have to work hard at selling this concept to organizations that healthier people is a good thing, then you probably, they're not going to be a good fit for it in the first place. Because when you oversell it, then you're going to, people start, especially some of the vendors and people start over-promising things. And, and that's why I think how we ended up down this path of, of ROI. So. Oh, absolutely. I've always said I'm not in the business of convincing anyone to do worksite wellness because I'm going to be hired by the people that already believe in it and want a strategic approach to it. So, <laughs> it, but it is hard because, you know, working in an organization to where people got the message that you need to go push worksite wellness is what every company should do. It's hard to undo that. So I think it is a message that, you know, when I was there going, hey, no, you don't. If a group doesn't care, let them not care. Let's not waste our effort. Let's really you know, put our efforts in the people who care. Let's work with yep. the willing. Work with the willing was a phrase my boss used to always say, and it's so true. Don't worry about the people who yeah. don't care. Um, so, yeah, I could go on that rant forever, but I'll stop that right now. <laughs> well, and how many, how many businesses do you walk in for that are saying, hey, I'm really, we're interested in wellness and we're interested in doing these things, and you're there maybe three minutes, and you're like, this is not even going to be a good fit. They're not open to change. They're... Their culture or their environment is just awful. Like you just you just feel it when you walk mm-hmm. in and and you go, you know, they're looking at wellness as something that's gonna fix their entire business. And oftentimes I just sit there and I go, I just wanna tell them, you know, I can't save your business. You know, mm-hmm. what you're looking at this is trying to save your business. That's not what this is. No. Um, you know, so I've walked out of a lot of businesses going yeah, that, you know, they're not going to be around in five years because they're, they're grasping at straws at this point. So Yeah, it definitely won't save a company. Well, let's be clear about that. Wellness will not save your company. <laughs> so, and, you know, we've, I've had those meetings, and I'm sure you have too, where they're like, gosh, we have to do this because we have to cut costs. You're like, oh, that is not where we need to be starting with this. Oftentimes, I see people tying a premium contribution to doing a bunch of activities. And mm-hmm. that is... That's not a wellness program. I wish we would just say that that is a health insurance you know, offset. We're trying to offset costs through health insurance and get you to check a box and participate. But I think that's where we get into. That's cost sharing with your employee. It's not a wellness yep. program. So I wish people would yep. just realize that you can go the premium contribution route. You can cost share with your employees. You can put it, make them put a check in the box. But just be honest that you're trying to cost share with them and get them to participate in something that they may not want to participate in. Yes, and I've, I've advocated with groups that are like, hey, we want to do this premium differential thing, and, and uh, they tell me why. They're like, and I, I said, why do you want to do it? Like, because we think that if people are proactive and they're up to date with their physicals and things, that they're doing the steps they need to take, they should pay a little less. I'm like, great. That's not wellness, like you said. That is, we're n- that is not your wellness program. That is not your initiative. That is part of being an employee here is... You know, you do this, you pay less for insurance. That is like a policy, a health insurance thing. We can talk about that and I can help you with it, but that is not a part of the wellness initiative. And Um, and in your intro, when we talked about you've done some crappy wellness programs, I absolutely have done so many crappy wellness programs. I'll I'll admit that. So I used to be a big fan of the premium contribution because I was like, yay, people participate, right? Because you get easily 80% participation that way. But as I've seen it evolve yep. with employer groups, you're just seeing people just going through the motions. So I now I'm like, don't do it. Let's just call it what it is. It's not going to get yep. people engaged in your wellness program. And it's not even a wellness program. Yep. So that is the end of part one of my conversation with Brian Passon. And I know this podcast seemed to abruptly end uh, well because it kind of did. Uh, but the next piece gets more into what Brian's up to in his world and how Wellness Underground got started. So go ahead and download that episode now. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. If you want to get your wellness program started in a positive direction, visit redesigningwellness.com. I have free resources, blog posts, as well as more information on my consulting services. Thanks for listening.